I've said to you in the email, I think that, you know, I saw Marie back in 2015 and out of that three-day conference, I thought, oh, I really would like to bring Marie here, and I'm glad I have because it's been <laughs> really enjoyable getting to know her and what she's about, the work that she does as well. Um, so um, Marie's a, a clair, medium clairvoyant uh, numerologist. She also um, is a numerologist of 40 years uh, experience. So um, I would like you to come back and teach that at some stage. That would be really yeah, nice. Yeah, cool. But anyway, she's got a wealth of information and experience to share with you today. So please welcome Marie Clement. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, and look, I've got my own notes here so I don't forget things because sometimes I go off on a tangent so I have to bring myself back. <laughs> um, I'll just put that down here. Um, but yes, look, I've, I've been a spirit artist for, since probably about 1993. <coughs> can everybody hear me, by the way? Yeah. You can? Okay. Um, so I hope you don't mind me just using these for a little bit, just to get started on things. But um, all of that, I mean, it, it's such a big story, but I'm trying to condense it. So um, it's like I, you know, it, all, it came naturally to me. And other than about spending 18 months back in 1997, learning how to mix and paint in oils, um, I haven't had any formal art school training. Uh, so I know that from, because I believe in past lives, that um, in previous lifetimes I was an artist. So I must have brought something back in with me um, to be able to do this kind of work. Uh, I was a farmer too, <laughs> by the way, but um, look, as far back as I can remember, when I was a child, um, I used to, I mean, I, I always had a deep love of, nature, uh, the mystical, the spiritual, the esoteric, wanting to know the truth behind things, you know, all living things. So um, I know you often used to contemplate infinity and space and all of that sort of thing, which was impossible with a finite mind. Um, but then I got into meditation, I read a lot, um, I studied numerology, Rosicrucian teachings and the laws of nature, the universe. Um, and yeah, just 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 loved it. Um, not really realizing that I'll be doing to what I'm doing today. Um, but uh, <coughs> I used to sit a lot in a corner and just uh, I don't know any, whether any of you had done this as a child, but I used to sit in a corner and thought it was quite natural to just draw eyes. I used to doodle. And I was only little, I was only five, and just doodle and draw eyes all over the page. And then eventually, um, little faces would come through. You know, I didn't think anything of it. I just liked to do it. Um, and then um, I, back in probably oh, the late 80s, the early 90s, it was when I was married and he was not into any of this and I was not going to push him or coerce him into it. Um, but he, we, my husband and I, we lived on a farm in North Queensland and um, I read a lot of White Eagle's teachings. I don't know whether anybody's familiar with White Eagle, anybody? Mm. Yeah. yeah, a few. Um, and it resonated with me at the time and I, I remember stepping outside and just talking to the stars, you know, and asking them to give me a sign. And at the time, um, my husband never wanted children, so I used to say, well, I want to help people. So if I'm available, so if you'd like to, you know, use me as a conduit or a channel, here I am. Um, and uh, one afternoon in about mid-1992, I was sitting there reading White Eagle's teachings while my husband was working outside. And... Um, then I sat and meditated, asked for a sign again, and he called, he called my name to come outside, take a quick look at something. So I ran to the top of the stairs, he came running up to grab his binoculars, and right by the window where I was meditating was a giant, was a big white eagle, and it was just circling, just circling, and then it just, it just went up 
and it disappeared. It was a sky, you know, blue sky with a few clouds, and it just disappeared into a tiny mini speck. Just went right, right out into space, almost, you know, like that. And I remember my husband saying at the time, "Gosh, eagles go high, but not that high." And what's this with a white eagle on there? I don't know. So I, I didn't let on, but I just knew, somehow I knew that was the sign. Everything in that year just changed for me. Um, and I ended up moving up, uh, I, I moved away myself up into Karanda, up in the mountains there. And it's when um, I then connected with other like-minded kindred spirits. Peter Irby, the author of God I Am books, and he was a publisher as well. Um, oh, I just thought I was in heaven with all these spiritual people. Um, and I, I remember sitting in a room one day, and all I had was just a couple of pencils, and there was a paper, and I could actually feel a presence behind me. And it came right, it was quite big, and it was like a sponge that wrapped half its way around me. And I just asked, well, what now, what next? And I picked up my pencil, and it took me a week to draw this, but it was a female face, and I just called it an angel of light. And then after that, it was um, a master's face that came through. Um, and then there was a gentleman that was traveling through North Queensland. I got introduced to him, and he could see things quite clearly. At that stage, I couldn't see things solidly at all and I still don't see things solidly um, but he could and he came up to me and said if I because he was giving talk on walk-ins ETs and all sorts of things then and he said if I could describe to you what they look like do you think you could draw them and I said well I could try so I was doing that for a little bit and then he actually in a way helped me to open up you know it's the third eye area um, and so, so it kind of started off, I mean there's a lot more to it than that, but it kind of started off like this, um, and it's, uh, it was like predominantly I was drawing mostly, it, since about 1993 after my whole life changed, I was predominantly drawing spirit guides for 10 years. Then passed away loved ones crept in. And I could see it was really quite a phenomenal thing for people to see their loved one on paper because that's evidential that we that we still live on after physical death. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know. Have, has anybody ever heard of um, the great psychic artist or spirit artist called Coral Polge? She was in England. Nobody. Oh, you've got to Google her. She was interesting. <laughs> and even before her, he was even better. Mm. His, uh, there was a chap called Frank Lear, L-E-A-H. He was amazing. And he actually could see uh, people that were in the spirit world, but in physical form. And they sometimes would come to his studio before the actual client would arrive. So he would already have the drawing ready, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, just amazing, you know. Um, so I just, you know, it's just, um, to me it's like spirit portraiture, it's like another way that a medium can provide this evidence of the hereafter. Because um, when loved ones transition before us, this is just my notes, um, the comfort that we receive is the knowledge that they're okay. Because I always get, oh, my loved ones are okay, is my father okay, is my son okay? And they usually are, almost always they, they are, you know, um, and have they arrived safe and well, which is normal, you know, because we're still human. Um, and so this sort of area is done through the art of mediumship. And of course, most mediums are called mental mediums, not because they're mental, but <laughs> it's because they get impressed in, in their minds, the messages from loved ones and everything. It's like what John Edwards does on stage or Lisa Williams and uh, such like. But um, spirit art is actually a branch or, you know, it's, it's like a branch uh, of that sort of skill which is called spirit art, I guess, because it's a branch of mediumship. But it's just a little bit different, you know. So, um, <clears throat> so the spirit artist then is a medium who is influenced to draw or paint art by the spirit world. 
and to become receptive to that spirit world it's not really a matter of psychic power it's it's more of spiritual aspiration Hello. Uh, I've got a few pictures on here to show you that each have a story with them so um, I mean my process oh gosh because everybody asks me how does it work for you do you really see them and it really varies sometimes my mind is impressed with the features I can feel the characteristics you know of loved ones coming through but look over the years also and I've tagged it at the end of the, the pictures here I've had unusual beings coming through also from other worlds and planets so I've tagged a few pictures of those on here so I hope you don't mind I just didn't do that at the afterlife conference because I think it would have been oh um, so uh, th there's just all sorts of things so nothing really phases me anymore or surprises me you know with what's there because there's so much more to this planet and to us than what we think you know um, so yeah look I just with my um, with, with the way I work it's like I just go into a bit of a receptive state I meditate before I um, do one-on-ones I meditate before I do because I've done um, public demonstrations with other I find that I work better with another medium because even though sometimes I can stand up and I can talk and I can start the drawing when I go in because I go into a slight like a light trance so that I can link up to the spirit world and get the features down it's almost like my mind goes empty I don't think but um, I'm guided by my own guides and they help me obviously because it's you have to work in cooperation with them and you draw it so um, while I'm drawing I don't want the you know the people in the audience to just twiddle their thumbs because it does go quiet so that's why another medium tuning in for them it helps to balance that out um, so I've done a few though so it's quite different um, working in front of an audience to doing one-on-ones you know but it's you know I'm just I'm just so grateful to be doing this and all I've ever wanted to do was really help people to help themselves you know um, and to wake up a bit you know um, and more men are waking up which is so awesome it used to be all just women you know, over the years you know thank God um, so okay uh, this is a painting I did once for a lady of the white buffalo calf woman this is done in oils and of course everybody's heard of the story about the white buffalo calf woman haven't they they're not she was she's to the Lakota Indians what mother Mary is to us she brought the prophecies and the peace pipe um, and I think briefly as the story goes many moons ago like thousands of years ago there were two hunters on the plains and there was a big storm cloud coming and it scared them and they started to run and the storm cloud was coming in and it might have been a UFO who knows but the storm cloud came in closer to the land and came in and all of a sudden a woman came out of this cloud and she was stunning absolutely beautiful and one of these hunters was highly respected was just thought oh my goodness what's happening here while the other one of course um, had other thoughts in mind and was walking over to her to whatever and she knew what was on his mind and she turned him to dust which is so handy at times isn't it? <laughs> anyway so <clears throat> um, and um, and of course the other one was so scared that um, he, she you know he took her to his village and she taught the people um, how to you know grow the foods she taught them about prophecy she taught them here's the peace pipe and all this sort of thing and then and then she disappeared but she can also come in as, an, as a very old woman um, and uh, she said that in the prophecies according to the Lakota Sioux it would a sign would be her return would be um, upon the birth of a white buffalo now I remember back in the 90s there was the the white buffalo that was born I think in America somewhere and when it turns um, four different colors it will return to a white color that's when they return or she returns so yes yeah, so that's brief kind of <laughs> about the white buffalo calf woman now this gentleman here 
Um, my one-on-one -on -one sessions are usually about an hour. So I usually talk, I do always do numerology in the beginning to link up to the person. And whatever else I get given from the spirit world, I relay that as well. Then sometimes, more often than not, my gaze go, I have a soft gaze um, and I look at the person and around them I see whether it's symbols, faces, sometimes past life images um, can come through, but it's very soft, like smoky effect and holographic, if you can imagine that. So I see it like, but I, but I try to describe that to the best of my ability to the person. So um, there was a woman, a client that came to see me and her, her um, husband had died and they were soulmates. And I didn't know any of this beforehand, didn't know her. And um, so obviously he got drawn and it was on that day that she came. I said, for some reason, I've got to draw a rose here, you know, and, um, and I've got the letter P and that was his name, Paul. And apparently it was their anniversary on that particular day. And she was heading up to, uh, I must have picked up on that too, but they were heading up to their favorite um, uh, like getaway because it was the anniversary. So um, he came through and she did have a photograph. So the, the drawings are not meant to be exact replicas, photographic replicas, only um, like a, a, a resemblance to the person that's passed. Do you know what I mean? Because it's not easy. It really isn't easy to draw um, faces from the spirit world. Um, but I, I get a bit of help and I try my best. And I think this is the... Because I like it when they can bring in a photo or they can send a photo. And I've done hundreds of portraits, but most people forget to send photos or they get carried away in the work. And I don't want to you know, um, like haunt people or, you know, chase after them too much. I do my best, but I like it when they can bring a photo. So I can have a look at the closeness, but you can see the, you know, the, um, the resemblance there. And then this chap here, um, when I go, when I went to Western Australia, there's a woman there, she produces a magazine. Um, I think it's called Universal Mind. And she came to see me one time and she was sitting there and her father came through. So I described the father and what he looked like and everything and that he used to smoke a pipe. And she said, yes, he did. I said, okay. So I drew, this is what I drew. And she found an old photo of him. I mean, some of the photos are not the best. So they're, sometimes they're blurry or pixelated or something. So I try my best to make it look a little bit better. But you can see the... Um, yeah, the resemblance there, you know. And a lot of times also, when we pass over in our 70s, 80s, 90s, we actually do go back looking younger in the spirit world. I've seen it. I've seen my own mother who passed away in two, two years ago now, and she's gone back looking younger. Who wouldn't, you know? <laughs> I mean, my God, otherwise there's going to be a lot of 92-year-olds up there with, oh, my gosh with young husbands that are gone before, you know. So you go, you go back looking younger. But they do, they can project the image, but it takes a bit of effort from their side too to project the image so that I can draw it of how the person would have last seen them, you know. But um, it's so funny because a lot of them don't want to look old or they've had bad, you know, memories of it. So they said, well, look, I'm going to come through looking about 50-ish rather than 80 or something like that. But at least the person still got their photographs of them. Um, and this was done in front of an audience. So I drew this lady here uh, um, and I, I remember describing her and, and things like that and when I held it up. And there was a woman at the front and said, yes, that's her, that's her mum. So she found, see, but this is her, she looks older here, mm. but you can see that there's a, there's a resemblance. Mm. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, so she was over the moon. And it's like when they see the, the, the drawing, they just know that's mum. You know, they just know it. Um, and of course, you know, they don't want to look too old and wrinkly. And then, oh my gosh, this, there's a whole story with this one, um, Heath Ledger, goodness. 
Um, I was stalked by Heath Ledger. Anyway, so... That's not so bad, is it? Well, um, so um, a few years back, would have been probably... When, when did he pass? Was it 19... 90, when was it? Or 2007? 2000, yeah, it was about five 2000, years ago. Five, six years ago. I think it was more, seven Batman, years ago. The Batman movie. Yeah. Died yes, now when did that, yeah. Because it was in that year that I got invited to, for the first time ever, to be on stage with um, Scott Russell Hill, who, um, he had a segment on, well, he was on the Sensing Murder series on in New Zealand. Remember when that was on? Do you remember that? Um, so I had to go on stage with him and Anthony Grizelka, he was the medium. So it was the psychic and the medium and then they had me on stage and oh my gosh, I was just so nervous because I've never been in front of like 2,000 people or so. I'm thinking, oh my God. And there was a cameraman right next to me and we were actually joking and carrying on. Anyway, as it turns out, I started drawing and I was just silent. I just went into my semi-trance while the, while the boys did their thing on stage and picking up on people and the medium picking up on so anyway I just drew one after the other but he was filming it and it got projected onto a screen above the stage and in the break I had a stampede on stage saying you've just drawn our son or you've just drawn our father I'm thinking really wow so I just you know I, I didn't get any payment or anything for it. I just was very happy to be there and just here because the look on their faces was it was like a relief, like something lifted from them, you know. And anyway, as after the break, we got back into it, just finished doing mundoring. All of a sudden, I had the strong feeling that Heath Ledger was next to me. But oh, silly me, because it was my first time, I just sat up and I thought, that can't be. No. What would he be here for? No. So you kind of analyse. You have to take your analysing mind out of these things, right? So I learnt from this. Because then afterwards I'll just breathe and I'll just say, no, just go away, go away, go away. Whatever this is, no, go away. Shh, shh. So I started drawing, get, got back in there. Anyway, Anthony comes in and he starts up and he says, oh, wait a minute, I've got to stop here. We've got a very special guest from the spirit world coming in and it's Heath Ledger. I'm thinking, oh, no, I just fobbed him off. Oh, oh my God, what am I going to do? So anyway, um, and he went on and it belonged to uh, this couple that were at the front and oh, right. after when it was finished I went up to Anthony and I said, oh you won't believe this, I just started drawing him and I thought I was just making it up, I thought it was just a, oh. he goes, what? Oh Marie, we could have had on me, I know. And you know what, I made a promise that should he ever come in again and I'm working up there, I promise you, I will draw you, you know. So two years went past and Scott and I, we did a, another show south of Perth in Armadale and as I sat down, I, I actually saw Heath's face go past mine about three times, <laughs> literally. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's fine, but I'm not going to draw you if there's nobody that it goes to in here. I've got to really, you know, sense it and feel it and the whole thing. Anyway, as it turns out, I ended up drawing him first because it was a promise. I ended up drawing him first. And Scott comes up, holds it up, and he says, oh, my God, Marie, you've drawn Heath Ledger on this. Yeah. Poor guy has been waiting two years. But, I mean, of course, there's no time factor on the other side anyway, is there? It's only, no. we only run by time here on this earth plane. So, as it turns out, he says, can you talk a bit about it? And I said, yes. It, he came through for a friend of a friend, like a close friend of the families, and the mother is here. feels like in that row, sec second row up, and it was a woman that stood up. She had tears. She said, yes, he was her son's best friend. So, it went to her. Then, another two years, talk about three in threes, another two years go past and I'm in Sydney and um, I wanted to do a workshop with Christine Morgan, who's a very good mediumship teacher, so I wanted to take it to the next level and uh, I'm in my hotel room and the workshop started the next day, so, and I really felt the presence of Heath Ledger again and I'm thinking, goodness gracious me, you know, so... I ended up drawing him. Next day, went to the workshop, end of the workshop, I went up to Christine, I said, look, for some reason, I'm, I'm being told I have to give this to you because you'll know what to do with it. She said, okay. She unrolled it. She says, oh my goodness, I know their family very well. And I was just talking to, you know, Wendy Zamet, uh, Victor and Wendy Zamet. Um, she was right there. And I said, well, okay, all right, great. So I went. And um, I never knew what really happened uh, with that until about another two years went past and um you know like 
um, Christine came up and she said, did, did, you, did I ever tell you what happened with that? And I said, no. She said, well, apparently Heath Ledger was an artist himself and he promised his niece, I think it was, his young niece, that he would do a drawing of himself and post it to her or give it to her. And it was the year that he died. So she was really upset and she was really grieving and everything. So what happened was that the drawing I did actually went to her. You know, so it's funny how spirit works, isn't it? Uh, sometimes you don't know why you're doing a thing, but there's usually a reason for it. And there I am in the hotel room drawing Heath Ledger's face again, thinking, oh my God, again. Um, so yeah, you never know what's going to happen, but it's near enough, I guess. You know? It's a good, good sketch. Yeah. Um, and then um, Percy, that's another one that I did for someone as a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that's the photo that she found of him. And in comparison, can you see the likeness again? You know, I mean, it's, it really is like um, more, for me, it's, it's, it's a really deep feeling with them. You feel them through, and, and, you, and it comes through your hand and you just draw it without really analysing or thinking anything. It's, it's not an easy task, but it's really quite an interesting process. And then this gentleman, I was up here probably about three years ago in the Sunshine Coast and I was doing some drawings up there and there was a woman, she travelled quite a way and um, straight away she sat down and thought, oh, you've lost your husband and she was full on in tears and uh, described him to her and I was, he, he, he had cancer and a you know, bald head and she said, yes, yes. So uh, she found a picture of him and another picture when he was younger, but can you see the transition? Like he's he's going from older to a younger, I uh, think. But yeah, so that's why I put the two, so it was so good that she gave me two photographs because you can see that there's definitely a likeness there, you know? Marie, if you look at that sketch that you've done, what comes back to me is a real uh, sense of... Um, this one? A strong, yes, strongness of determination of, of knowing. It's when yes. You look, when you look at it, it comes back and the feeling comes back that uh, this person's complete. Yeah, if that makes sense. that's it, that's it. And yeah. it just gave us, she was so relieved and it consoled her so much, yeah. you know. Um, it just, it picks them up. It's like they walk out on air. Well, he looks you really know. confident there. Yes, and what they also do is, a, a lot of times I tell them to close their mouth, don't open, <laughs> and have a big smile. Although now I'm getting more into it, but it's just, otherwise it'll take me ages to do the teeth. Oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my gosh. So um, what they do is they try also to concentrate and focus. You can see a bit of that on his face, that concentration and focus. Let's get this through for her. We must get, because it's a form of communication, but through drawing, through art, you know. Um, but yeah, but thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, this lady too, I was in Canberra and I did this sketch. She also, gosh, she also drove like, drove like four hours away and it was her best friend that used to be a hairdresser and she came through and sometimes I get names, not all the time, but sometimes I do or I get letters and other things coming in through. Um, and then she had on her on her phone she had a picture of her so yeah, it's reasonably close but she knew it was her you know <laughs> and then yes again audience members grandmother came in through and it was sometimes sketches happen really quick and other times takes a bit longer you know on average I think it takes about 20 20 to maybe 30 minutes most of the other time it's just talking you know but yeah so, um, but apparently Frank Lear that I was talking about before, gosh, he could get absolute realistic portraits done. Um, there's one there that looks so real and he gets it done in like, uh, there's one that he did in like uh, 10 seconds. Gosh, that would be miraculous to do that, you know. But yes, so, and here's another one that I also did for people up at the Sunshine Coast was their brother that passed away in a motorcycle accident and that was their, <coughs> they only had that sort of a picture on their phone but you can see that he was so cheeky too. <laughs> and then, oh my God, this is an interesting story because I was in Halls Gap of all places and I had a client come and see me and she looked like, uh, like Indian but also Aboriginal 
but I could tell she was born in India. And I said to her, you're, it's very interesting because you've got like a couple of nuns around you. And she said, yeah, that would be right. <laughs> and one of the nuns was actually her auntie, but the other one was Mother Teresa. And I explained that to her. And I said, does that make sense to you? You've got Mother Teresa there. She said, oh, yes. So she, Mother Teresa used to visit her family and try and convince her to go into the nunnery herself. And she said, no, Mother Teresa, I'm not doing that in this lifetime. No. So it made total sense to her that Mother Teresa would be around her. But go figure. <laughs> in some little, you know, country town, there's someone with Mother Teresa around them. And she had these photos. And that's her, her aunt there. And they were greeting President Reagan. Is it Reagan? Mm -hmm. Yes. Then? Yeah. So, and then another lady, um, I think in uh, the audience, ended up drawing that and she actually researched it and found a picture of her great-grandmother. Gee, but it's not easy to find great-grandmother pictures, is it? Yeah. You know, so, and this is another, um, oh, it's a grandmother, my friend's grandmother actually. Um, never knew what she looked like, I think, but I was tuning into it. This is in the early days, and I ended up drawing this, and she found a picture of her grandmother there. And then also, you know, like they say, when you, with spirit guides, you there's no evidence with spirit guides. And, yeah, much, most of the time there isn't, but they are there, and they can project an image that you can best relate to. Um, now, for this one girl that worked in a gallery in Adelaide, she also, unbeknownst to me, had a, a deep interest in the 1700s, in the time of Marie Antoinette and all that sort of era and the art then and everything. Anyway, I picked up on a woman that was called Elizabeth and I think I even put the name down there because I said it was quite unusual and she was an artist in her time about the late 1700s, early 1800s and she painted Marie Antoinette like two or three times. And she said, oh my gosh, really? So anyway, I didn't hear from her for a couple of years and she rang me one afternoon before Christmas, two years after I gave her that picture. But this is one of my earlier pictures. And um, she found that Elizabeth Le Lebrun did exist and was an artist and painted Marie Antoinette three times. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's this, kind of a likeness there, yeah, with the puffy hat and the, yeah, so that's one evidential thing of a spirit guide, isn't it, really? Um, and then Auntie Mim, this was um, an Aboriginal lady that came through, also in an audience session, and um, she, her characteristics, came through, and there was um, an Aboriginal woman in the group, and she was just lovely, and she said, oh my goodness, Marie, you've drawn my Auntie Mim. And the only photo she had was this, but I don't know if I've got the, oh yeah, yeah, I've put them together. So you can kind of, and she, she was also, um, she stood up for women's rights in her day um, as well, I remember that. Um, and she'd be in the newspapers every now and then, she'd bring people in that were destitute and she was just a lovely woman. Um, so she came through for her, for her um, granddaughter. Um, and then this gentleman here, um, I was in Serena down south, a little town down there, and we were doing, there were a couple of other mediums, oh, and one of them was crazy, but anyway, um, we had a dinner thing, and after the dinner, we set up, and there was a, a table in front of me, and a couple of other tables, and the medium started up, and she picked up on this, this boy, and I, as I was, I first started the drawing and it felt like he took his own life, you know, and kept going with it and really felt a bit sad with things and he had a puppy or a dog. But anyway, so this medium comes in and starts and she said, I've got a young man here that took his own life and I want to say his name's Mav Maverick or Mav or, and the table's going, yes, you know. Anyway, when I finished drawing, I held it up. Oh my God, they're all screaming, you know. So um, one of the ladies sent me a uh, photograph of him. You can just sort of see his dog in the corner there, but yeah, there's, it's reasonable likeness. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, and then here's another one. Um, Caleb, I love this one. This, because um, he came in through, some of them come in really strong. 
others are not so strong enough to really work at it, you know, uh, you know, get, help them to, to project but also have to really sit and ask them to come in closer. This one was really quite strong but his mother came to see me in, um, gosh, I think it was, and she travelled all the way from Melbourne and um, I even got the name, I remember. Uh, but uh, he, he was a funny one. He, um, he, descri he described himself and um, ended up drawing him. And I said, it's really weird because I feel like I want to put glasses on him. But he didn't really need to wear glasses. It was like he just put frames on himself because he, with, without the, the actual glass part in it. And she said, yes, that's what he did because he thought it looked cool and he looked, you know, more intellectual. <laughs> and he was very much, you know, he was into the arts and um, theatre and all of that sort of thing. But um, yeah, so she, that's, that's the photo of him there. Mm. I don't think I could, no, I didn't get, couldn't, but you can see the, um, the likeness, eh? Mm. <laughs> Fancy wearing glasses <laughs> without the actual glass in them. <laughs> oh gosh, so he's a funny dude. Um, and this here, do you remember the Claremont murders? Mm. You know, in Western Australia? Do you remember those, that? Mm -hmm. Years ago, it's still a mystery as to what happened to Sarah Spears and where her body is. And um, then I was really involved with uh, Scott Russell Hill, who worked for Sense the Sensing Murder series. And his TV producer friend from Perth, uh, Denise, she asked me one time when I came to visit him, they were all there, they were setting up cameras and things. She says, Marie, if I give you a pencil and a paper, can you just tune in to Scott and see what you get? And I just thought, okay, I'll give it a go. And um, this is what I drew. And I felt, oh, she feels like she's been strangled. And she said, because she, she didn't tell me anything. And then afterwards, she says, yes, you've drawn Sarah Spears. So she sent me the um, photographs via email to compare, you know. But she was hanging around Scott, you know, Scott Russell Hill to... You know, and he's also been working on the, um, there was some other, you know, the Beaumont children case and everything. So, but he doesn't do, he doesn't like to do that sort of thing anymore because he sees the horrors, you know, so it's not really good. Um, and this girl too, when I was with a sh in a show with him, I drew this young girl and straight away I felt she, she got murdered as well. Um, wasn't very nice. And when I went up to Scott, I asked him, can you just confirm with me, do, can you recognise this girl? And he says, oh, that's Rihanna Baru. She's gone missing from Adelaide. You know, she went missing in Adelaide. I thought, oh, okay. So, you know, they're coming through, but I don't really get much with it except that they were murdered, you know. Um, but that's her here. But you can see the, the resemblance there. And then, um, oh gosh, yes, here's another gentleman who was um, the husband of a lady in Western Australia. That's the photo that she had on her phone, and that's the comparison. Mm -hmm. There. So yeah. So it's it's just for that for people really it's just proof of afterlife, you know. And then oh my God, that's a whole story too. But I'll keep it short. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <clears throat> there was this couple, they were originally from South Africa and they came to see me. Um, they, were, they were Dutch but they were originally from South Africa and they lived, they moved to Western Australia and um, I didn't really know what they did but apparently they worked in government and uh, when I tuned into them I said, oh my goodness, you've got this um, gentleman who was in politics and quite high up and I want to put a name like M there, you know, um, but also I kept getting something like Madiba or something, which then they confirmed, oh, they used to work for him or work with him and they used to call him Madiba. Do you remember that? Yeah, in, in, yeah. Um, and so this is, yeah, this is what came through for them. But obviously he's still working hard on the other side, you know, helping them to, to, you know, still work in politics and make a difference in the world. You know what I mean? So they don't just stop, they still keep doing things. So that's Nelson there. And I think I've got them together. No, I didn't. No, but you can, you can see that there's that likeness. Um, but yeah, they loved him. And then he even described to me that there was, and I had no idea at the time, but 
I said to them, and there was a statue recently done of him. It was a big, like, it's quite big, or, he's, or it's a big bust or a big statue. But the funny thing is, because he's having a bit of a giggle, there's a rabbit in his ear. They laughed and they said, yes, it was the, the sculpture, the people that did the sculpture. Um, they, they put a little rabbit <laughs> just sitting in his ear and I thought, oh, I wonder why they did that. I still don't know, but mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> it was a funny thing. And then, of course, spirit guides, because there are beings like this um, that are actually, they're actually light, but they'll project an image, you know, uh, of how they want to come through um, for people. And of course, American Indians, um, they're also quite busy on the other side because a lot of American Indians were also quite spiritual. They had a connection to nature and the great spirit and they honored um, mother nature, you know, and respected it. So they're working on the other side too. A lot of, (coughs) it's a funny thing because a lot of mediums um, in the past actually have had American Indian spirit guides and I used to wonder about that because not every single person has got an American Indian, but um, it's one way that they can uh, help with us Westerners to open our consciousness and to become more aware and, um, y- you know, like be respectful towards the earth and all of this sort of thing. Um, but it was Maurice Barbonell, he was a medium and he was quite high up, wasn't he, in the um, spiritualism back in the early 1900s. And he used to channel Silver Birch. Do you remember the Silver Birch teachings, any of you? Yeah? Yep, Silver Birch. Um, And of course, then there was Grace Cook with White Eagle. Um, There was another woman too. She used to channel Red Cloud. but I've forgotten her name now forgotten her name um, <coughs> so they come so I'm just on the tail end of a cold here too so um, I've drawn them and then I've also drawn unusual type of things like nature spirits not all of them look like that but um, there was a lady that works solely with nature spirits which I didn't know and there was something that looked like this and she could easily resonate to it you know but the colors are not so strong they're more subtle than that it's just the colors look a bit stronger um, with that and then recently probably about a couple of years ago I was at the afterlife conference in Melbourne and there were some people with UFO books and paraphernalia and um, Mary Rodwell was there she was giving her talk and I was sitting down and I thought gosh, there's some interesting characters here. I wonder if I could just go, you know, and relax and just see what comes through. Anyway, this is what came through. Um, There are beings with almost like conical looking heads, you know, from, so I hope you're open to all of this. With conical looking heads, there's the ones with the big bug eyes, which you know, you know, there's the greys, but I can also sometimes see tall white ones with, or white or bluish, with big eyes. <clears throat> but that one came through. There's lion type of beings. Um, there's this who looks a bit more humanoid. Um, uh, oh, yeah, I'm not too sure exactly where they're from. Some are from the Pleiades or Arcturus or these sorts of areas. Um, and then this one almost looked quite Egyptianish, you know, like Akhenaten type of thing. But these are the type of beings that actually are still, you know, around uh, people and just watching. Um, So I had to draw that and uh, share that with Mary. Um, And then there were some other ones too uh, that looked a bit like this, um, angelic type of forms as well. Um, And it was after that conference, there was um, a young girl who years before she'd done some drawings and sketches and they were almost identical to this. She was also at the Mary Rodwell thing. I'm not sure if it was Leah, I think it was someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, And she sent me an email to show me. I thought, oh, for goodness sake. So confirm for me, because how do you confirm (laughs) this sort of thing? Uh, But yes, and of course, these, these sorts of figures as well. You know, there's just all sorts of uh, beings. Um, Same with this. Uh, There's a woman that, um, she's a teacher, 
and she often sees this type of being around her. She seems to think he's from Sirius, seriously. So <laughs> I just put it as a Syrian being. Um, and sometimes I just see these like um, orbs of light or golden with, with uh, like uh, images of beings inside that. Uh, so I just draw what I feel, see, you know. Um, here are some more. Um, it's a spirit group that belonged to another UFO researcher, actually, down in Melbourne, I think. And um, <clears throat> she had, she's often seen this one in blue. Um, and of course, there's the humanoid-looking one again. Um, and the see the Indians same with some of the Aboriginals they actually had a telepathic connection with some of these beings from the stars or they called them star brothers does that make sense mm -hmm. mm, so I'm glad you're all open to this uh, <laughs> and then oh gosh there was this guy oh he was weird but he, <coughs> I ended up tuning into him and I did a quick sketch of what was a lizard, I've had all sorts, I tell you, it was, it looked like a lizard and he was very happy about that, I thought, oh, oh, oh wouldn't be, <laughs> but anyway, knowing what we know about Richard, but anyway, he said, I want to commission you to do a proper big painting on that, oh my gosh, don't show this to your girlfriends, <laughs> but anyway, so he got me, because he can see these city, these cities as well, as well. Um, but, and, and these were the kind of I don't know, like um, symbols that he could see, so I put it in there. But um, it was it was a facial feature similar to that. So I don't know. Are you familiar with reptilian type of? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, and then of course the lion beings. Has everyone heard about lion beings? Yes. No. no. Yes? yes. Not many have, but some have, um, and and it's just it's so natural for them because. You know, some, there, there was a, a lady, I think her name was Wendy Munro, and she was an author, she was a spiritualist as well, and she used to travel, um, you know, astral travel and go to other planes and planets and dimensions, and she would often have, I think she called him Mesha, and she asked me to tune into her one time. I didn't know she had this, but I could see that there was this, oh, like a lion looking feature. But they used to, you know, and then there was something to do with ancient Egypt. I mean, you know, you've got the Sphinx and all of that, but the Sphinx has got the the human head and then the lion body and all of that. So <clears throat> it's like she seemed to think these lion beings were also in ancient civilizations. They'd come in and, you know, share their knowledge or whatever. But I ended up drawing that for her. And she's since passed away, of course. But since then, I've also heard other people, not many, that actually resonate to the lion beings. So there are these sorts. And then of course you've got these little, these children that are being born with um, abilities and things. Um, star children, indigo children. I think there was a magazine that was doing an article on these and they asked me to paint, you know, like a star child. So I thought, oh, how do you paint that? So I just thought, well, okay, I'll just do something like this. but. They're, they're, apparently they call them indigo children because the colour in their aura is an indigo blue sort of colour um, and yeah a lot of them also have probably had incarnations on other star systems and things and they've been born here now you know and even over the past 10 maybe 20 years now you know or 15 years or so um, and oh this is something completely different because there was a woman is some more she um, had an experience and <clears throat> she had all these symbols that she drew. She got, I think it was in the middle of the night, she had these dreams that were really vivid. I can't remember the whole story because I thought, oh. <laughs> but then afterwards, after learning a bit more about it, I thought, oh, you know, there's something to it. Um, she drew these really quickly and then she drew them up and then she came to see me she says Marie can you actually draw them to make it look like they're three-dimensional a bit I thought well I'll, I'll do my best but it's I don't know whether it's some kind of a language or you know I, I don't know symbols you know it might be um, maybe a, a star language or something but these are the symbols that she got 
So, yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. That's it. That's it. My heroes from way back um, was Leonardo da Vinci. I used to, even as a kid, just be really fascinated by this man with a beard and Leonardo da Vinci and everything. And I used to have dreams of being like in an old classroom and dressed in a different, totally different way to what it was like back in the 60s, 70s. I used to have these dreams, but I just ignored it. And it was a couple of clairvoyants that said, um, you know, you've had uh, incarnation back in, you know, the Renaissance era. And I thought, oh, really? Okay. Um, and uh, something to do with, you know, Leonardo da Vinci. I said, yeah, but Leonardo da Vinci would never have taught any anyone. He wouldn't have had students, you know. And it was only years later that I came across a book, opened it, and there it said in black and white that Leonardo da Vinci used to teach his students. And I thought, oh, my God, he did have students. Um, that if they were devoid of imagination, just look upon or gaze upon a rough whitewashed wall. You know, and I used to do that as a kid. Um, <clears throat> but yes, yeah, so look, there's also, there's also, oh my gosh, there's um, a few stories here too. Uh, let me know if we, okay, I've gone over or something, okay, love? No, you're right. Okay. Because there's um, one time Ernie Dingo, he came to see me, a friend brought him over. Do you know Ernie Dingo, the actor? Okay. And he came to see me and he's sitting opposite Oh God, he was so funny, funny as a fart. And he sits there with his arms folded. He says, oh, what are you gonna do? I said, well, I'm gonna just tune into you and just see, see who's there. He says, right. So who's over on this side then? You know, and I thought, well, I described who it was. I said, there's a shorter gentleman, shorter than you, white hair, Aboriginal, white beard. He goes, all right, what's on that side? And I thought, oh, <clears throat> it's a woman, curly hair, um, kind of large. You know, he says, okay. And what's on the other side of the other guy? I said, oh, now he's skinny. He's got like a red bandana thing. And he goes, now that's the one you've got to watch out for. <laughs> 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 you know, I thought, oh, no. Okay. Oh, no pressure. So I ended up drawing his grandfather. That meant a lot to him, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and then I ended up um, painting a huge painting of him for the Archibald. But I also snuck in the background there ghosted images of his mum and his um, grandfather that taught him, you know, the ways. But um, he himself was saying that he can, um, for instance, some of the Aboriginals can actually look into your eyes and go in here to know if you're sincere or if you're lying or not. They had this ability. And then he also told me that sometimes when he used to ring up his friends, he'd be on the phone and they can travel. They can actually travel to, uh, to the other place, you know, like remote view. And he used to ring up uh, some of his mates or his friends and some of them would be sitting there in their, you know, their orange, you know, um, budgie smugglers or something. And he'd say, oh, mate, not a good look sitting there. And he goes, well, how do you know that I'm sitting here with them? And what, oh, you got new fish. And he, they would, it would freak them out, you know. Mm -hmm. So he never did it again. But, um, but yeah, there's more to, <laughs> the, to these people than meets the eye. They don't often talk a lot about these things, you know. Um, but I remember one time in Perth, uh, there was a young lass that came to see me. Unfortunately, she, I, I've done, I did a drawing of her father. Her father came through and they were really close, but I never got a photo. So I don't like to put that up without a photo. I like to see the comparisons um, and, you know, to get a bit of validation. So she came to see me and um, she kept asking me, Marie, and it was all this information coming through, but she had to, what she wanted to know about this, this nickname that her father gave her, that called her this particular name. And oh my gosh, I thought, oh my God, it's not that easy getting names, you know, no pressure. So um, next minute, I'm just talking around it. Uh, and I finished the drawing. She was so happy with that. And we're still sitting there talking. And next minute, honestly, it was towards the end of the session, <clears throat> up behind her where her father was hovering her mother suddenly came in I said oh my gosh I've got to tell you something here your mother's over she's very animated they're having a talk 
she's just doing this. I forget what else I said. And this poor girl, I looked at her, and she's looking absolutely blank, blank and leaning right across me. She said, but Marie, my mother's not dead, though. And I thought, oh, I'm so sorry. Let's go back to that little name. Help. <laughs> you know, because I thought, oh, I'm just relaying what I'm seeing, sensing. So I thought, well, I'll just leave that. And I said, okay, they're telling me this is a small name. It sounds... I feel like saying baby, but it's not baby. It's more like Biddy or something. She said, yeah, it was Bibby. I thought, oh, great. So anyway, we hugged. She left. I went and got a coffee, came back in, and the people in the shop came running in and said, you know that girl that just left? She came running back in to, to tell, tell us this to pass to you. I thought, what? So, you know, she rang her... Um, she wanted to ring her mum and her sister that lived in Brisbane to tell them about the drawing of the father. And um, when she rang, the sister answered the phone and uh, said that mum just passed away an hour ago. So, see, so there's me thinking, oh my God, Marie, how can you pick up on your mum? But you just got to trust these things, you know, spirit knows, it's just our little, but it's just how bizarre, I must have really phased her because I never ended up getting that picture, that photo, damn it. But, um, but it's, it's just so interesting how this all happens. Um, so yeah, it's a matter of really just trusting, you know, and going along with it. Um, <clears throat> um, there's a lot of also, there, there's like another time um, when I was uh, working in the Flinders Ranges near Port Augusta there, there were some people, the, the girl that was booking people in for me, my friend, she said, Marie, there's, there's a couple that want to come from Victoria, from Shepparton. I'm thinking, what? That's like hours and hours away. No, no, no. I'm going to head down there in another two weeks to Hamilton. So just let them know that. No, they drove all the way to Quorn. And um, I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, gee whiz. So, but as it turned out, their daughter that just passed away recently took her own life. And they were a very happy family unit. They used to be really happy. So it was a really sad thing. Ended up drawing her. But I picked up that she um, left her home country town and moved into the big city of Melbourne, went to university, was sharing a, um, a room with a girl. And there was a big, I said to her, there was a big argument about something or, or about a boy or something like that. And um, there must have been, I think, some uh, alcohol or, or um, drugs or something because she then uh, took it to heart, ran out and she hung herself, you know, mm -hmm. so it's just, it was just awful. So of course, p as parents, can you imagine what that would feel like, mm -hmm. you know, so um, yeah, it's not good. But um, I just wonder if also you've, I mean, there's Coral Polge, Frank Lear, but have you also ever heard of there's a couple of sisters called the, that's an unfortunate name, but it's called the Bangs Sisters. Ever heard of them? They lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, I think it was England. And uh, they, it was quite extraordinary what they could do. It was something called precipitated art, which was another form of um, evidential, you know, thing coming from spirit world. But this is different um, and it's really rare today. They would fill the whole, you know, Royal Albert Hall. People would just come. And there would be an, uh, an easel sitting in the middle of the stage with a blank canvas on it, right? And a box of paints at the bottom. And they would sit in a chair on either side of this easel. And then when everybody sat down, it was all quiet they would go into a trance or a, or a meditation. They would just sit there. They did not touch the canvas. No one, no physical human being touched the canvas. But everybody could see um, an image start to form all by itself on canvas from an invisible artist. Mm -hmm. And some of these paintings are so realistic and extraordinary. Oh, my God, it, it's just amazing, you know. So have a look at that too. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, so, and, and since then I found out that there were some others too um, in America. I think it was, they called themselves brothers, but they weren't really brothers. And they also could do this sort of precipitated art, it's called. That would be phenomenal. 
because how would the you know <laughs> how would the skeptics analyze that you know <laughs> they'd find something you know oh gee so you know you can't convince everybody but um, but yeah it's quite 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 interesting um, and then I just wonder if like oh, there's another there's another thing here too um, have you have you heard of a man called Luis Gasparetto from South America. Okay, he there's it's, I think it's on YouTube now, but um, my sister took footage of it when it was um, aired in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, and it absolutely I was mesmerised by it because this man he could um, it was so Telly Savalas was the host. And they filmed this guy, he could just go into a trance, close his eyes, use both hands and on the table just do this, like that, and he'd sit back and he'd hold it up mm -hmm. and he'd channel all these artists through him. And one lot be signed Monet up here and the other one was like Da Vinci down here. Perfect faces, you know. Absolutely incredible. So you have to look look that up. Luis Gasparetto. So it's L U I Z G A S P A R E W T O, I think. But he's one of the best I've seen. And then he also used his feet. He'd be sitting there and just leaning back, and it's like he's having a conversation with them, and he's just drawing. And it's the most exquisite image. Again, you know, amazing. Just amazing.